So I've shown you the basic way of building a progressive web app, uh, which is to cache your core files and just kind of let everything else come from the network. Or maybe cache it as you go. But that's not the only way to do it. So the choices that you make in what you cache and don't cache have implications both for disk size and performance. So we need to talk about different PWA architectures. So of course, you've all seen the, uh, the offline dinosaur, or as Pete the page likes to say, the dinosaur. Um, you know, ideally we'd like to make this dinosaur extinct. You know, not, not have the offline anymore. So we don't really want error internet disconnected. We want your app to keep working. So one way to move an existing site to PWA is the thing you've been doing, which is first deploy HTTPS, uh, use caching strategies both for offline to make it work there, but also for uh, performance. Cache the things you need to make it work fast. The thing we haven't talked about is the app shell architecture, and we'll talk about that in a minute. You should, of course, add home to screen, home screen manifest file, and then add the other special features like push notification, payments, API, and credentials. So what's an app shell? So an app shell splits out the content from basically the navigation, the core parts of the app. If you've been building a single page application, this is usually all your main navigation stuff, and this is the templates you use for your content. It's really pretty straightforward, except that in a PWA, so this stuff usually has URLs and comes from the cache API. This stuff might have a URL and come from the cache, or it might be in the database. And it might be template rendered or not. It's up to you. So let's talk about some different patterns. First off, just a couple of basic reminders, basic terms. So server-side rendering is the thing that you've been doing for a long time, where you build the page on the server and send it to the client. Um, so the page grabs everything, and a page update reloads the whole DOM. Right, this is old school, but it still has its place. Client-side rendering. The server gives you a template page with some CSS and JavaScript. JavaScript does XHR or fetch, hopefully. Builds the page. Page reloads change the dynamic content. Now, a lot of people think that client-side rendering is always better. Maybe, maybe not. Because the problem is the time it takes to load all of this extra JavaScript sometimes makes your app slow. Classic example was Twitter. Twitter was one of the first places to go from server-side rendered to a front-end only HTML5 single page app. And then about a year later, they reversed course. Because what they discovered was this. When you build a single page app, think about the load cycle that you go through. You load the page, great, you load the CSS, you load all the JavaScript, and only after you have all the JavaScript can you make network, network requests and start building the page. That slows you down. So a server-side rendered page, you could slap some content up there. Maybe it's not interactive, but it could be on the screen, and then you load your scripts in the background. So what, one thing, there's two things you could do here. One is you could use server-side rendering, but cache the common files, the stuff that shows up on every page, and then for offline use, if you get static pages from the server, you can stick those in the cache. Right? When you're online, you grab the static pages, you hang them in the cache, you're done. And add special code for offline mode just to tell the user, hey, you're offline. You're not going to be able to browse to these things. So detecting offline use, I mentioned earlier, there's a navigator.online property, or you can listen for on and offline events. Now to cache client-side rendered, you know, basically cache your single page app, your core code, your CSS, your template page. Um, now, cache API or index DB, how do you make the decision? Cache API takes anything that takes a URL. Everything else typically goes in index DB. Now, there's exceptions. Like, has anybody seen the Pokedex PWA? 
There's a Pokemon one. So they're actually caching the images in the database as blobs. It made more sense in that application, the way things are being pulled up and manipulated. The nice thing when you've got an offline client side rendered is when you're offline, you could save user actions for replay. So in an e-commerce app, somebody might set up an order. Um, anybody use Gmail offline? So Gmail actually supports offline mode, and you can sit there and write emails and basically queue them up for sending when you get back on the network. OK, so fine-tuning the app shell. We're actually back at kind of what we were starting to say earlier about the data can live somewhere in the network or the cache, and how you store basically what you fetch and which order is a design decision that you need to make. So the first one, what most people do is cache first or cache only, which is you cache the files and you get them from there. Now cache first means grab it from the cache, display that, and then go to your network and see if there's something newer. Any ideas what, what kind of data you might use this for? Sorry? So maybe a newspaper article, something that changes less frequently, but you still want the current version. Metadata for the site, you could do this way. Things that change infrequently, but you really want the latest. Now the one thing to watch out for is if you do this, then what you should do is, if you get new data, tell the user if they're reading a current article, if you get a new one, don't just change it on them. Put a little note on the screen saying, hey, I've got newer data. Can I update it? Actually, another interesting place you get this is um, user icons. User icons change infrequently. So you get them from the cache first and then revalidate. So cache, then network. So network first with a cache fallback. What would you use this for? Always asking the network, and if it can't, get something from the cache. Any guesses? Right, time sensitive data, stock prices, uh, in e commerce, like levels of things in the store, weather information, you know, anything that can change live. But giving the user some information, even if it's old, is better than nothing, just as long as they know it's old. There's another one here that's kind of interesting. You're not going to use a whole lot the cash network race. This one's kind of weird. You throw the same request to the network and the cache. How many people assume the cache is always going to win? I, I did, right? The cache should be faster than the network, except when you've got a really old computer, right? If you've got a really old computer um, with a slow drive on it or a network file system that's slow, it could take longer to get something from the cache than to get a fresh one from the network. This is a pretty rare condition. You'll probably never run into this in practice. Shaky networks, well, but your cache will come back first usually because it's the local storage. This is really for if the cache storage, for whatever reason, is going to be super slow, you could throw a race out there and, and ask for both. Some people also use cache network race as kind of a cheap version of uh, get it from the cache and then revalidate on the network. But in this case, you actually do kind of want to do them in the cache first network fallback. So cache network race is pretty weird. You don't use it very often. If the user clears the cache, then it depends how your app's written. You know, if your app, if, you're, if the user dumps the cache and your app is offline, well, no more offline experience for that user until they go back online and they reload and the service worker builds a new cache. So the other thing is clearing the cache will also remove the service worker control script. So the next time would be a brand new service worker. The service worker, by the way, you notice when we did the list of files to cache, we didn't include the service worker.js. The service worker automatically caches its own control file and does a detection. Every time you go to create a new service worker, it does a detect whether the new file is, has been updated. And if it's not been updated, it uses the old worker. And if it's been updated, it creates a new one. So. I mentioned all these strategies. The good news is you don't actually have to write code. There's a tool I've mentioned before called SW Toolbox that's a library. It's on, uh, it's on GitHub, Google Chrome slash SW-Toolbox. 
and it's a bunch of caching strategies that we've written for you. Now, they've got some extra features in here, like you can not only specify the strategy for a cache, but you can say things like the lifetime of the cache, the maximum size, maximum number of entries. So we have logic all written through that to do that kind of cache management. Somebody was asking me earlier, well, what, you know, like if I have something in a cache that's in a session and it times out, how do I, you know, handle it? Use this, just put a timeout on the cache. Or use this and modify one of those algorithms to take into account the timeout on that object. The other interesting tool is SW Precache. But we'll need to talk about Gulp before we go very far into that. SW Precache is a code generator tool. You tell it what paths and files you want cached in your application, and it writes a service worker for you. Again, open source under Google Chrome. So it hooks into your build process, usually Gulp or Grunt or whatever you like to run, um, Webpack. It writes the service worker for you. Um, it also deals with things like content changing and cache busting. It will actually generate the hash codes for each file and append them to the URL and detect when the file changes and grab the latest. So it's all that code that you would really have to write to build a professional grade app already written for you. Then to finish the PWA, you know, you've seen the manifest file. Um, manifest file for Android for other browsers include meta tags. There are very specific ones. They're in the they're in the lab notes in the textbook. So the meta tags make this work on Safari, at least for home screen install, and a special manifest file on Netscape. It's kind of a pain having to do three different things, but this is one thing that's not yet fully standardized. And for push, um, actually we've talked about push at length. Um, when you get the push message, it gets delivered to the service worker. Service worker pops up the notification and that wakes up your app. We'll go into the details later. And so for high performance pr uh, apps, let's talk about the recommended order. So I told you the Twitter story. So what did Twitter wind up doing? Because they said, well, shoot, the front end only application is slower. So what they started doing was they started doing server side render of the page. And then once that page displays, which displays very quickly, they async load the rest of the scripts to connect to the network and then start grabbing fresh tweets. So they server side render once and then do a takeover. And that's exactly what we recommend is that you design an application shell server-side render the, the initial page, defer async load any scripts that you need that you don't need for initial rendering, let them come in later, cache them, and then use JavaScript to grab anything else and do a takeover. Gives you really high performance apps and it's not hard to write. The next way to do it is an app shell and use JavaScript to grab once the app shell is loaded, kind of what you've done before in server-side rendering. The next best is just server-side render the whole page and cache it. And then the slowest uh, would be to do full client-side rendering, basically your standard single page app. So people have asked me about Angular. Angular 2 has actually been designed with this first approach in mind. It's written in universal JavaScript so you can run it on the client or the server and get the same render. And it's designed to do a takeover. So real world examples, I will actually leave this up to you to go look through some of these. I'd love to see some of your stuff show up here. It's kind of an old list. And then the resource list here. Okay, time. <laughs>